Hi, uh, my name is Mer. It's a nickname. Uh, my artist name is initial E. Sherman Heyman, which I did way back in the 80s when it seemed to me that there weren't a lot of women artists out there and I didn't want to be identified as one from the get-go. Um, I've been working on social issues probably since the early 90s, but my interest in gun violence started in the 80s because I was an avid reader of the Philadelphia Inquirer. And as I had mentioned during the opening, um, I started collecting these little tiny stories in the back pages of things that to me were so revolting, so upsetting, I, I couldn't understand why we all weren't running down the street screaming for help as a country. Little stories about a 14-year-old boy shot at a bus stop for his sunglasses, and on and on and on. So I collected these little tiny stories, knowing there were lots of stories behind the little stories, and I started with a series called Icons, Mitigating Circumstances. And I made six triptychs using woods and metals. They were three-dimensional and they were meant to look like religious icons. And each one recounted the story, a story from my collection from the Inquirer. Just so many revolting things that as I said, I, I, it surpasses belief that people weren't up in arms back then. Up in arms, what a great expression, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for 10 years, I did a variety of projects and series about violence in this country. And it seemed to me a lot of it revolved around men. And sure enough, when I did research, I found that Almost all gun violence is committed by men, which, and I like men, don't, I'm not, this isn't, a, you know, meant <laughs> to be derisive. Um, but then I figured that it must have something to do with testosterone and some, something in the fight or flight instinct, something. So I segued within the series to um, a piece, I wanna see if I can show this while we're talking. It's a big, was a big piece for me at the time, and it's a collection of beautiful, beautiful antique gun handles that all look mm. like penises. Okay, we'll show that in a minute. Um, but to me, the, the mystery of gun violence seemed to hinge on an attraction repulsion thing because guns, people collect guns, they are beautiful. Sometimes they're worked with silver and engraving and we all had that thrill as little children when we played cowboys and Indians and we had little Colt 45s. And I think that stuck with us growing up, especially with men. Mm. And there's like, here's a statistic by the way, that I enjoy. The more educated, the less likely a person is to own a gun. Huh. That was something. Um, and I'll get to some other political um, aspects of gun laws in a minute, but let me see if I can show the penis piece. Now the lighting is not good. Oh. Oh, I see it. It's very much not good. No, it's just reflecting. Um, I'm going to turn off one light here. No, it's still, it's reflecting the other lights. Wow. Yeah, this is the shot I try to take a picture of. But pull away from it. You can see, you can still see it. It's just a little bit yeah, of a glare. Reflecting. Yeah, but it's uh, diagonal drawings, uh, diamond-shaped drawings 
well, maybe I can at least show a close up of a couple because they're really stunning in their um, shapes. Mm. Of course, I played with the colors. It almost looks like um, like stained glass from a church. You're right. You're right. You're right. When I, I use a lot of black because it shows up the color and part of my process is uh, using a four ply museum board where I peel away areas. I score into the, the museum board so I can mm -hmm. get black lines. And I'm still not able to get this. Oh, well. And, and then, then I had to do a female piece. Ah. This is easier of triggers, gun triggers. That, mm -hmm. that one was just a fun piece, if you can say any of this is fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very helpful for my state of mind because I felt like I was dealing with, in my own way, being appalled at all the gun violence. Oh, it's a shame that piece doesn't show. Let's see if I get that. You can see a little bit better. Yeah, you can see it. And they're all actual antique guns. Um, so the political side of the lack of gun control, um, I learned that starting in 1813, many states started banning concealed weapons and that even the federal government gun laws passed in 1934. People were doing pretty well. I mean, I have a quote from a sheriff, or no, I think it was a governor of Texas in the 1890s who was working to get guns banned mm. because he said the only reason a man would be carrying a gun would be to shoot another man. And that's that, that. And that quote is in uh, your current piece at the exhibition, Thoughts and Prayers. Correct. Oh, I think it is. Yes, I foraged around to make that piece from a lot of my past work. Oh, good. I'm so glad you could see that because that piece does involve getting up close and personal. Yeah. And uh, being able to read those quotes, but it. We, the country was doing well with gun laws until the 1970s when special interest groups got all of these laws overturned and NRA became a big guide, guiding force in this country. But um, when the uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger made a comment that I think has been quoted, maybe this is that particular piece, when the new interpretation of the Second Amendment, it used to mean a well-armed militia, mm. and we didn't really need militias for a long, long time. But the new interpretation, he, he said, and I quote, one of the greatest pieces of fraud on the American public by special interest groups that I have ever seen. Mm. So, um, it's just, it's just, I don't know. And then after what happened on Sunday to that poor man in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Yeah. It, it's weird. I, yeah. And, and, you know, I have to say, I, I just feel like, I feel like we're surrounded by violence right now. And I don't know if it's always been this way or if it's getting worse. I just, I just feel like it's a constant, like news cycle of violence that I'm hearing about, and a lot of, and most of it's gun violence, or it's, it's violent words towards other group of groups of people, and it, it, it is a repulsion. And but there's groups of people that are attracted by it too. Right. And I think, I think what's changed now is that people have cell phones and record mm. these things so that we can actually see them. All of us can see them. When George Floyd died, 
that was the first person I ever saw die before my eyes. Mm. And it took me, I don't know, it was probably two months before I stopped having nightmares. And then the other thing too is that there, for a long time, like in, in Philadelphia, where I've lived since I was, I don't know, 20 something, um, a lot of the stories that I collected from the Enquirer, the reason they weren't on the front page was because they were little black children getting killed. Mm -hmm. If those killings had happened to white children, it would have been on the white, the front page. Yeah. But yet, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember, back in the end of the 60s, I was living in Paris as part of a junior year abroad program and I was living with this incredible older woman. She was a retired chef mm. and she didn't care for me too much because uh, she didn't speak English and I didn't speak French. I picked it up living there, but I do remember one day she came into the dining area and threw a newspaper, most of Figaro, on the table and started pounding on the, ta on the table and pointing to an article. And I'm, I come over and I'm trying to see what she was pointing at. And I'm reading all the little headlines. By then I could read French. And I was like, what happened? Did, what, did a bomb go off? What happened? And there was a story on the front page about someplace out in the country where I think a 16 year old had gotten hold of a gun and accidentally shot a neighbor. Mm. I don't think they were even killed, but this was a big story. And she was just saying, look at that, look at that. So it's horrible, it's hard. And she's going on and on. And I wanted to say to her, you talking about lady? Mm -hmm. This happens in the United States every day, all day long, all over the country. And mm. fortunately, I, you know, then she really wouldn't have liked me. <laughs> but it, it's sort of the difference in the culture, even back then, stayed in my head because the whole point of all of this work about gun violence is to me, there is something very unique about the American flavor of violence. Mm. Not that other countries don't have it, especially crimes of passion and someone knives their neighbor over broken tree trunk. Or, you know, things happen, of course, but there's something about America and I don't know the answer. Yeah, I just, I, 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 I do find, feel that we are unique and I think the, the amount of violence we we are willing to tolerate within our own nation yeah um but yeah i mean i'm i'm very intrigued by the way that you you uh you put these two um polarizing ideas with each other of the um of the seduct the seductive nature of guns but then you look more closely at these images and and you can see the the repulsion quality to them too and um it's it's very very beautiful work and i'd like to share the piece that we have in the exhibit now um four thoughts and prayers up at shishama madawan until september 19th so Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great shot. I see um, the details. Oh, you took lots of detail shots. Great. I did. Oh, yeah. can you can you see the enlarged image? Yes. You, oh, okay. Yep. Okay. And so, um, yeah, so this is um, recaps and reconnaissance read with Scrofito and Mixed Media on Museum Board. And can you just describe what Scrofito is for those watching that might not know? Yes, uh, it, I think it's an Italian word that means scratching, but um, it was used in the Renaissance because a lot of painters, I think, would take the end of their brush and actually stroke through the paint to make different kinds of textures. And I can't remember where I first heard of it. Um, 
but I, I think I did it as a child. I, I was really big on Crayolas. I'd go through boxes every week and I would layer them and then take a bobby pin and remember bobby pins? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw your number. <laughs> <laughs> but now I do it a little more sophisticated. <laughs> I use um, wax oil crayons as a layer mm. and then I cover it with uh, oil pastels, especially iridescent oil pastels. And I must have three dozen different tools that I can use to scratch through the top layers in different ways so that not only do you have very, very interesting textures, the colors mm -hmm. are unique because uh, depending on how you layer and how deep you go through, you get different nuances. It's why my photographer keeps promising she's going to quit working for me <laughs> because <laughs> it's so hard to actually take a picture and capture the real color. Mm. Well, I have to say in, in real life, the, the, this, this piece is a lot richer in color too. Um, the reds are richer. I, um, in the photograph, it look, it has a more um, pink pastel quality, but then when you see it in real life, you could see the, the redness come out. And well, it looks good. I'm looking at 11 different shots on my screen. Oh, I wonder, I'm, I'm trying to just, uh, I thought I shared, maybe if I enlarge this thing, full screen. Do you see it now? Just the one picture? Oh, no, I see the, the whole picture. And then I see the three images that I have sent you. And then after that, there are seven detailed images where you actually, I mean, I can't, I can't get them larger, but I can see you got the quotations. And oh, okay. That's, that's weird. My, I am only seeing the images on the, on my screen. I don't know how well, to. Maybe it's my, maybe it's my iPad. It's been sick lately. Mm -hmm. I have to take it to the doctor. Oh no. So, <laughs> so, uh, but I do want to, um, I'm, I'm glad you actually described how you, um, how you created the, you know, did the graffito scratching specifically with this piece, because when I, when I was looking at it, I'm like, is this like, is, is it all just wood and like different layers of color? <laughs> <laughs> Like, how did she do this? <laughs> well, it's it's a lot of fun, but it's it is very tricky. I often will do a piece that I spent weeks on, and then hang it on the wall to look at it and go, who who did that? And have to take it down and totally relayer everything because when you see the whole thing, and you see the good lights, not just mm. the lights on my work table. It looks different and not good. Mm. So, but yeah, I, I could see how lighting would really affect you know this pe this piece, especially because it's so um, the larger gun shape is so delicately um, made in in the nuances of color. So. Um, let me ask you, did you, did you, how, what was your planning in creating this piece? Did you start with the larger, with the large gun? Yes. Or, okay. I, um, this is part of three pieces for recaps and reconnaissance. I was kind of looking back at series I'd done in the past that I've come back to over time. And one was gun violence. One was death. And one was um, aging. Mm. And so in a way, it's almost a collage. There are bits and pieces. There are um, different rectangles. You can see the division between uh, how all the collaged elements are on there. With the overarching image of the gun, you know, facing left, and other smaller images of gun parts and violence along with these quotes and adages. But uh, a lot of, I don't know, I just 
a lot of my work is extremely detailed, but it has to be read from a distance where you can just look at it and either go, eh, okay, and walk, or hopefully you look at it and then you start seeing more things and mm. then you want to go up close. Again, it's that attraction repulsion thing. Yeah, and, and during the opening reception, one of the words that stuck out to me that you, on how you described the piece was seductive. And I, I and I I see that in a way like the the image overall it kind of reminds me of like like the opening scene from one of the Bond films. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Where they're like you you know it's 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 a movie peddling violence, but but you know they they make it seem so alluring, and um that's that's what this piece does too like you know it, you're showing the violence and the statistics of the violence but at the same time it has this alluring quality to it that um it's almost like sexy in a way <laughs> yes oh yeah oh i'm glad you said that there's a lot of that there there's a lot of sex and violence and i think maybe it's human nature but i think back to driving the car with my parents and there'd be a slow up and then we'd be inching by. There was some horrible accident. My mother would say, don't look, don't look. Whoosh, my head would swivel to mm. look because I wanted to see, I wanted to see, were there dead people? Was there, is there blood everywhere? I mean, being scared of it, but also this intense curiosity. And I think all of us have that to some degree. Mm. And it's why we like horror movies. I mm. can't watch them, but you, you want to watch, spend two hours watching these monsters come out of the woodwork, you know, dripping blood and snot and they're coming after you. Is, I don't know. A lot of people enjoy that. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm. But gun violence has been... Oh my gosh, the westerns that we grew up watching on TV and in the movies and it's 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 definitely a part of the culture of this country. Yeah, it's definitely. I wish we could do something because anyway, I don't want to you know <laughs> get obsessed. Oh, <laughs> no, but I mean that that's that's what the context of your work is. I mean it's about this, you know, the eternal attraction of firearms, as you as you put it, and what and what that like. Where does that come from? You know, I actually I have a I know someone who um, they collect guns, and they uh, to, to the point where um, I find it dangerous as to how many guns they own. I'm uh, and I've <laughs> you know, but but they they love this collection and. I, I honestly don't even know how to have a conversation with them about it because I don't understand it. And I think, I think it would be, it would be meaningful and helpful for us to be able to understand where their love and obsession for it comes from. Well, you know what? I don't know if you can pull up the image of the gun handles because the picture that I took in the studio and sent you mm. is a million times better than what I tried to show. But all of these are actual antique gun handles. And when I was doing the research on it, I, I really, oh my God, I was knocked over at the beauty, the mm -hmm. beauty and the creativity that went into these guns. And I, I don't know if I'd ever want one, but I mm. can definitely see, especially a collector going after these you know some of these guns were from the 1600s um but they, they they're they're just beautiful they're carved and they are as sexy as you can possibly get although i had a chuckle because a lot of them look like they're drooping <laughs> <laughs> and, and i do have the picture up and enlarged and the more i look at it the more it really does look like a like like um a church window especially with with the image in the in the center it, it almost reminds me of a candle lit oh, 
Christy, I like that. I like that. <laughs> and I can see because the, the black lines dividing the shapes, you know, look like when you see a stained glass window and all the welding parts holding all the glass together outline different parts. Yeah. Yeah. Nice analogy. And the, and yeah, and again, it, it does have that seductive quality to it. And, um, I, I, you know, knowing what it's, what it's symbolizing too, it, it adds a little humor to it. In a way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's the other thing is all this work I've been doing for decades, some of which is disturbing. Like I spent probably seven years doing things about death, which, oh, let's just say I'm terrified of it. Mm. <laughs> everybody else and I thought by, by dealing with it I'd have fun with it so when I started the first series in, um, in this project called The Final Frontier I started carving tiny little caskets out of wood some are open and I did I think 36 and they commemorate people like Picasso or Coco Chanel or um, a Hellfire Maggie, a pirate, and just all kinds of people. Julia Child, um, Hieronymus Bosch, and I carved them and I decorated them, and they are funny. Mm. I mean, they're funny, but they're meant to be warmly commemorative. And then I did more serious things like tombstones and whatever, but the death thing, uh, that actually, you know, that got me obsessed too for a while. I did also, um, I think, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, and I think I saw a video on your website about the series too, uh, that you had on YouTube, uh, sharing all of the different tiny caskets. Oh, yes. Oh, that's right. Oh, do you know John Thornton? I've heard of him. Is, does he have a gallery in Brooklyn? Uh, no, but he actually, he lives in New Jersey. Oh, okay. And uh, I think he lives in Ocean City, but he for decades has been, he's an artist, but he's been a phenomenal videographer of artists and their work. So if you ever need a, someone to video, he'd be your guy. But um, yeah, I remember, yeah. I think on my website, I have uh, the sh a short version of, uh, he did a, two longer versions of stuff in my studio. And the collection that you have of the, of the, of the death series was, was pretty, pretty massive amount of work too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw at least 20 or 30 pieces, but it looked like there was more. Yeah, well, yeah, there were a lot of the ca little, little tiny caskets, and then I did, I just did isolated pieces. Um, I did uh, one beautiful, it's almost abstract, just of tombstone shapes, casting shadows that are all in blues and silvery blues. And then I did a three-dimensional piece out of metal where I actually made tombstone shapes and hammered letters into it of actual things that were on actual tombstones. I think my favorite one, because I'm not making this up, uh, my favorite one was, I told you I was sick. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, um, I had a lot of fun with death. So what, what was the research involved in finding actual uh, quotes on tombstones? Did you just visit uh, cemeteries and write down quotes that you, that you liked? No, Google was my best friend for a while. <laughs> I did a lot of research. I also did research on um, death customs, mm. death customs around the world. I did um, some research on ways we execute people. Mm. Um, I did a piece on that. Um, I found out that there are, um, I can't remember if this is the Trobriand Islanders or some 
community that's a little bit set apart from the rest of the world. Um, when, when a loved one dies, they take them and they put them in a big barrel of, I'm not sure what kind of uh, liquid, salted liquid or something that preserves the body mm. so that the dead person can continue to live in their hut with them. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that, but <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to go there. <laughs> well, some of the, some of the odd burial customs stayed with me that I didn't use in peace, but yeah. um, I, I don't know. When I start on a new project, I always, maybe because I'm a reformed English major, but I do tons of research and I make notes and sketches and write down little factoids and all until visually it starts to take birth on what it's gonna look like. And then sometimes I don't even use my research, but mm. sometimes I do. That's why I have so many words in my pieces. Yeah, but I, I, I really like that. Um, I, I, I enjoy, you know, when you combine different elements of media, including you know, poetry or text or even statistical information and visual media, I feel like you absorb it better. Yeah, I, you're right. You're right, because there are people that are primarily visual that the words help and, and people that are more literary and the visual backs up. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I, while I was reading through um, the, the statistics and the quotes on, on your particular piece, um, uh, recaps and reconnaissance, I was, you know, I felt like I was like really absorbing the information. I mean, I couldn't, you know, tell you verbatim what all the quotes were, but I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, good. Well, that's yeah. great. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you brought up, Another thing about um, about how different uh, cultures uh, do, you know, execute people too, and that also made me think of the history of public executions in the United States and how that used to be a big thing. Like fa families would co co like go out and like make a family day, a family outing out of going to a public execution, and that goes into that whole attraction and repulsion thing again. Yeah, absolutely. And let's not even the other side of that coin was in the not so olden days, they would hang black people mm. and they, they'd set up picnics. Yeah. And children would come and people would drink and party and watch a black man get hung. So I mean, yeah. And death, well just I when I when I was starting all the research about death. I remember, I think in a statement, I wrote something about death is the new sex mm. in the sense that once upon a time, you never said the word sex. You would talk about, you know, relations or something. And now you can be sitting on the bus and someone next to you on the cell phone is talking and it's like great detail about mm. sexual things. But death, nobody really talks about death. And people don't even say somebody died. He passed away. Mm. He left this earth. He's gone to a better place and so forth. And yet, I, when I was doing research, I found that, in again, in the not too distant past, when someone was dying, um, because probably there wasn't a lot medicine could do, but it was acknowledged that that person was fading away, they'd be ensconced in a bed in the house and people, friends and relatives and people would come and come and come calling. And there would be um, these heartfelt talks where the dying person would often give their blessing or forgiveness or something. Mm. It was just out there, it was a part of life. And now, oh my goodness, really, I think our fear has, ex except maybe people who are very religious mm. have, a, have a different attitude. They um, perhaps believe they'll be meeting up with their loved ones 
in a better place. But we don't seem to be able to talk about death in a way that acknowledges that we're all going there. Yeah. I, well, I, I think, I think um, part of it might have to do with um, modern medicine's gotten better, so people are living longer, generally speaking. Yeah. And, and most, most of the time, um, when people die unexpectedly, you know, you know, when, once you reach a certain point in life, you know, when you're much, much older, you know, it, it, it's expected at a certain point. But when you're younger, you, um, most people either consider it either there was a tragedy or, you know, a violent tragedy usually, or um, they, they had some sort of um, incurable disease that still we, you know, so, and I think we're frightened by those things. So we don't want to talk about them. Yeah. True. It's yeah. True. I think I think we can process it better when 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 you know it's someone much much older. You know, because at that point, you know, we we get it. You kind of get it at that point. Like you can't live forever. <laughs> but right. when it happens right. to someone at a younger age, I think it hits a chord with people. Just like that's that's not the natural way to go anymore right for for parents to lose a child i know is the unthinkable, mm -hmm. unthinkable but. but i think it's interesting that we're afraid to talk about death but I, but we're surrounded by violence and there's this allure of violence but at the same time i feel like um as a culture we also try to ignore that it's there Do you think that's changing now? In the well, last I, few months? I think I think the the people who see it acknowledge it, and the people you know the people who want who want to be hold themselves accountable and hold others accountable, they will acknowledge and see it. I think those who don't want to come out of their comfort zone of what what they've structured. Um, I guess the way the world works, they um, are not willing to see it. Well, it's coming at them whether they want to see yeah. it or not. Well, Is well, you, you know the whole the whole uh, the whole adage and classic saying, you know that a lot of a lot of white people say when when uh, black people are interacting with the police is, you know, they should have followed the directions or they should have listened. And it's always victim blaming. And even when they see it right in front of their eyes, they still find a way to blame the victim. And I think it's because they don't want to see what's right in front of them because it scares them. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because like so many other things, they're was up until now, let's just say 2016, people who were racist and misogynist and so forth and so on, they kept their nasty words for the inside of their house in the local tavern with mm -hmm. like-minded people because they knew better than to say things like that out loud. Around 2016, that all changed, and I think a lot of people who think the way you're describing felt totally comfortable in being right out there slamming uh, other races and women and everything, and it seemed to blossom. It didn't just appear, mm. it just came out from under the rock it was living under. Yeah. I agree. So, I, I, I agree with that, and I think I think along with that, as time has passed, I feel like they're testing their boundaries more and more about what we can, what what they can get away with. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And, and I think that is surging in in the in the amount of violence that's occurring, and the divisiveness, and the yes. just the general feeling of just. Um, all from different directions, anger and hatred, and I, I, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to process the amount 
of anger and hatred that I feel like a lot of people are, are generating. And again, it goes back to that question in, and, you know, trying to understand why and where is it coming from and how is, why, like, I, I just don't understand how it serves them. Well, that's a question for a good psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it is unthinking. It's the, maybe the way they were raised. It's what they heard growing up and you just repeat it. Yeah. Like, you know. God, I think I'm thinking of doing a series of things my mother used to say that I didn't realize when my daughter was born, I would say the same things. And then I noticed my daughter was saying the same things. Mm. When the kid asked, why can't I have another piece of cake? Why? Because I said so. That's mm. why. <laughs> things that get carried on from generation to generation without thinking about it or in you know having any sort of self-awareness about it mm. and then people repeat things social media you get want these sites like breitbart saying those horrible violent vicious things and then they get spread around even more and more and people who may have some bad feelings now are emboldened oh i don't know christy i don't know where this world is going to i which brings me to another <laughs> point, which is in 2016, by chance. Ah. <laughs> what happened that year? <laughs> <laughs> landmark year. Um, I started doing political pieces, mm. but I um, the series was called Wheel, Deal, Steal, Then Spin. Mm. And they were mostly small pieces, but I was looking at politics from a historical viewpoint and doing, they were almost little cartoons. I found old engravings from the 17 and 1800s, and I would cut them out and do these collages with text bubbles. But, um, and, and I was looking at things like, um, I, uh, one of the pieces was called um, Theraputrid. Mm. instead of therapeutic and it was about how this country for I don't know how many decades performed horrendous medical experiments on poor people on black people on children who were who were locked in mental institutions they were given uh, all kinds of drugs to see if something worked and sometimes it worked so good it killed the people mm -hmm. and this went on until the 1970s until the wow. 1970s so anyway it's all political it is really wheel deal steel and spoon mm. but it helped me doing doing all that work made me feel better yeah <laughs> and, and that, that comes to a whole other a whole other plethora of issues that we have in our country and and the fact that we don't deal with our history and we don't we don't un, we don't know and understand our history properly and um because uh, you know i i think about think back to to my grade school experience and my high school experience in history classes and everything was just so glazed over it was always rushed through and like i I think I think um, everything was um, the only thing I can really remember was the glamorization of the founding of the country. <laughs> Christy, you are absolutely right. Did you ever read a book called Lies My Teacher Told Me? No. <laughs> uh, I'll have to read that. Um, this was one of the books I used for doing research about these political pieces, lies my teacher told me. And uh, the writer went in and looked back at things printed in textbooks. And I'll just say this one little thing. He found out that for decades, all schools used this one particular history textbook. I think the company was in Texas. Mm. And every few years, the 
textbook would be updated a little because you know more history happened. And in it were all these lies and misrepresentations that we are all taught, all of us. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the reason all these schools were using the same textbook was was all political. Mm -hmm. It was all political decisions in, and uh, going back, I can't even remember all the details, but it's a fascinating book. Yeah. Things, I think history is being looked at in a different way. Yeah. So that's, that's another good thing coming out of all the turmoil the last few months. So not yeah. that it's being rewritten, it's being re-examined. Yes. So. I think, uh, honestly, I feel, you know, knowing what our history, knowing better about our our history is, it's it's finally being written properly, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Well, because there are more diverse voices writing it. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, we had, you know, old white men writing all of our books. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. More women and diverse people. But I think, I think, but I, I appreciate the fact that your work captures um, those moments, uh, some, so many moments in history and so many different uh, perspectives and so many different, different ways of looking at things that we might not normally look at, especially, you know, death and, um, uh, you know, the uh, looking at our founding fathers in these very, very minute, particular ways, too. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know if I ever run out of social issues, I don't know what I'm going to do. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, remember, I don't think after all, <laughs> I spent years on all the violence work, and then I was sort of winding down with it when, 9-11 uh, happened mm. and I ended up doing some, a series called the Mark Portraits. My husband's name is Mark. Mm. I had my photographer shoot portraits of him. I had to force him to not smile because he smiles all the time. His full face profile and three quarters. And then I did pieces about identity. Uh, it so happened right before 9-11, we were flying somewhere, and he's Greek, so he has a Mediterranean complexion and a mustache, and we were stopped in an airport for no reason. He was stopped mm. and asked for his passport and all of his papers, and I thought, wow, that's peculiar, and then 9-11 happened, so I was thinking about identity. We all do this. We don't think we do, but you pass a woman on a, the street, and within one and a half seconds, you've already figured her out. She's got a gorgeous handbag, must have cost $800. You know, just the shoes alone would pay my rent, you know. And, and we make these snap decisions about who a person is from what they look like. Mm -hmm. And God knows if after 9-11, if you looked Arabic or Mediterranean, people were looking at you. <laughs> with suspicion. So I had these photographs of my husband. I had them printed on rag paper, great big sheets of rag paper. And then I, using Scrofido and other uh, media, I painted around him and painted costumes on him. So the same face is um, like a, a court, a court, helper for, uh, during Louis Couture's reign. Mm. Um, there's a, a Byzantine priest. I did a lady in waiting, a French lady in waiting from the 1600s. Mm. I had to actually paint out his mustache. It was really <laughs> hard. But all of these pieces together, just it's the same face. It's the same person. But what they're wearing and they're the background, which architecturally might be a church or French tapestry or something, mm -hmm. makes you see a totally different person. Mm -hmm. So that kept me going for two years until I felt not 
but I felt less scared about yeah. this identity issue. But I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we can only hope that um, that we figure out a, a way to communicate and talk talk with each other in more in more productive, meaningful ways. But as artists. I mean, I, I think there's some outlet to do that, although not necessarily the people we are we need to reach are being reached. <laughs> well, that yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. We all live in our own bubbles, mm -hmm. and social media, whatever we choose to watch, sort of reinforces what we already think. So I, I don't know. I'm hopeful. This is America, and even with all the bad things we know, you know, who was it that said democracy is the worst form of government, <laughs> except for all the other forms? Mm. Who said that? Was that was Winston Churchill or somebody? I, I can't I'm not know. sure who said that, but I know the quote. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think we'll come through this, and I yeah. think come November, and I hope everybody gets out there and votes. Mm. Um, I think that the, the tenor of how this country will move forward will be different. I, I, I hope so. There are a lot of people I talk to who are very hopeful in that manner. And I appreciate other people's hope and express, expressing it out loud because I feel as though without other people being able to express their 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 hope out loud I wouldn't be able to find any myself um, so yeah. I appreciate yeah. it every time I hear someone tell me that they're hopeful that things are gonna get better. <laughs> yes well I, I believe it I mean I believe it I didn't a few months ago but um, I'm believing it more and more I'm seeing it in um, everybody I know is being an activist in some way, like writing postcards, reminding people to register to vote or sign up for absentee ballots. Um, I've been doing a lot of postcards and my handwriting sucks. <laughs> I have to really concentrate so it can be legible. <laughs> mm. But I think, I think people are finally feeling hopeful. Yeah. Because this can't, this can't go, this just, it can't go on. I don't think anybody wants to live in a world this divisive and negative. Yeah. I just I'm 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 very tired and I just I just want to stop thinking about what the president said every every 20 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Or what did he do now? I don't want to know. <laughs> I want to. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to you know maybe maybe once every three months you hear the president's name. <laughs> I know. I, I think I think a lot of us have gone from the beginning. We used to laugh at the absurdities, and then after a little time passed, I think we got really angry. Mm -hmm. and, and now I think there are more people like me who are now moved on to being terrified. Yeah, terrified of what what he's capable of but you know we'll see I, I am hopeful yeah so Mer, is there anything you'd like to share uh, before we wrap up the conversation oh um, I'd like to see if I could show a couple of pieces from my new work Ooh. which isn't I don't know if it's a social issue but it's become more personal and I've been doing this now for two, two, two and a half years. And as I said, I'm a lapsed English major. So words are always being used somehow. But I started thinking of this expression that all of us seem to use, even when we're not aware, or even when we deny that we use it, the word like. Mm. If you walk down the street and he overhear a conversation of a one sentence, he'll hear it used three times, like, <laughs> you know, somebody says, oh my God, I was like, just so exhausted. But I like, you know, turn on the TV and I was like, 
okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so this one word started jumping out at me because I realized it served a purpose. People use it to buy themselves a little time. I like, right? Mm -hmm. I could say to you, damn it, Christy. I was furious, but I don't want to get that emotional. So I'll say, damn it, Christy, I was like really angry, you know? So I'm mitigating what I'm saying. I'm buying myself a little bit of time. So I started doing pieces, some small, some big, with one word adjectives that I picked because I just like the word, but just describing feelings, my own mostly, which run the gamut, everybody <laughs> else's. And then I had a lot of fun doing the background, trying to visually conjure up what the word was. Um, and I have some pieces on the wall, so I'm going to see if I can um, Okay. So this one detached mm. and that piece the letters don't quite go together oh i see the pattern doesn't go together um this little guy raw you know the palette is just sort of raw meat mm. and the letters the raw are just kind of vibrating um Queasy, which made me queasy while I was doing it. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, which is a French word, uh, bouleversé. I don't know if you know the word. I don't. But it's, it's one of those wonderful French words that can mean different things. It really means being really knocked over by something mm. it could be in a good way or a bad way but when you use that word it's like you are overcome and then this was the first one i did edgy and it was sort of the easiest because i did a font where the letters i don't know if you can see it the letters seem to vibrate mm. I don't know if that, and then the background pattern, the colors morph, the shapes morph as it moves out. It be, it's one thing and then it goes to another thing. It looks Semicircles become diagonals. Yeah. So, uh, so this is what's been keeping me busy. Um, um, and I have a show coming up actually. In, uh, next month, I'll send you a thingy um, yeah. of this work.